welcome to the uh, Libertarian Alliance meeting, or is it the Libertarian uh, Student Society meeting. Um, and uh, we meet here every month, and uh, you're welcome to come along every time, uh, if you would. Uh, tonight we've got Stephen Berry talking on Cobden and foreign policy. With, uh, hold it, hand it to you, Steve. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Richard Cobden's life, first of all, and then I'm going to move on to uh, a few thoughts on foreign policy, um, and it will be both about the 19th century and the present day, actually. Uh, Richard Cobden was probably the most prominent classical liberal of the 19th century in the UK. Uh, it, it's not at, uh, me who just thinks this way, by the way. Uh, Ralph Rako, the um, American libertarian historian, called him the greatest classical liberal thinker on international affairs. Uh, Cobden was born in uh, Midhurst in Sussex in 1804, and he had the sort of childhood that um, you see portrayed by Dickens in David Copperfield. His, his family wasn't particularly wealthy, uh, suffered various hardships. They lost their uh, farm in 1814, and Cobden had minimal schooling. And he was eventually sent to work in his uh, uncle's warehouse at the age of 15. He rose up, though, and became a commercial traveler. Um, and he was quite close to his brother, uh, called Fred, who seemed to have helped him in uh, various business ventures. Uh, Cobden was very, very fond of his brother, but uh, he regarded him as a bit of a waster and rather feeble. But actually, when I've uh, read around this subject, my impression is that Fred was just Fred. He was just the normal guy, the average guy, who um, j just didn't have Cobden's uh, determination and um, uh, dynamism. In 1832, Cobden moved to Manchester. Um, and Manchester was a city of the future in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, Cobden wrote to his brother, he said, um, Manchester is the place for money-making business. It is there that every one of us must sooner or later go. Asa Briggs, the historian, called it the shock city of the age. It was the most, you know, literally the most advanced part of the world in the first um, half of the 19th century. And Cobden there set up uh, his own uh, calico works. This was a uh, a firm where he had um, he had the printing works for the calico uh, near Clitheroe in Lancashire, and he had sales out outlets in London and Manchester. And um, evidently, his earnings from the firm were typically around about ten thousand pounds a year, which was quite a sum for those days. And of course, Cobden could just have stayed, I think, a fairly successful businessman, but his ambitions were um, rather more than that. And he'd already written under the byname of Libra for a newspaper in Manchester discussing various commercial and economic questions. And then in 1835 and 1836, he published two pamphlets. One was called England, America, and America, sorry, England, Ireland, and America. And the other one called Russia, was called Russia. And they were immediately a, a bit of a hit, and Cobden was regarded as someone of uh, some significance. Uh, the biography of Cobden, the first biographer of, of Cobden, was uh, called John Morley himself, a quite notable classical liberal. And he, he actually, in his uh, biography, wonders how uh, someone like Cobden, who'd barely written before, uh, could have produced such an accomplished uh, li literary work. And uh, But Edsel, another biographer, an American who wrote a a more recent biography it says that Cobden had already presented a play for production at Covent Garden in his youth. So Cobden actually wasn't uh, with these pamphlets, just bursting onto the stage, not having written before, as far as I can see. Anyway, the, 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 the main message in the two pamphlets um, was um, for peace, non-intervention, retrenchment, and free trade. And these were the ideals uh, which... Cobden remained faithful to all his life, and they were the um, uh, really the basis of, of um, classical liberalism as regards foreign policy in the 19th century and, uh, and still today. Uh, so some of his best quotes are in these pamphlets. Uh, one of them is, it is labor improvements and discoveries that confer the greatest strength upon people. By these alone, and not by the sword of the conqueror, can nations in modern and all future times 
hope to rise to power and grandeur. And another one is that uh, the key to any nation's prosperity and power lay not in conquest, but in commercial supremacy. Cheapness will command commerce, and whatever else is needful will follow in its train. And I think they were, they were quite, as, um, quite novel when you were just following the mercantilist age where the whole tenor of uh, economics had been we must gain an advantage by uh, you know, ex exporting our goods to other countries and preventing other countries exporting their goods to us. And uh, they caused quite a, quite a stir. Uh, another, a number of things in these pamphlets were also quite interesting. He attacked this doc doctrine of the balance of power, which dominated British foreign policy in the 19th century. Uh, for instance, uh, it was one of the aims of British foreign policy to prop up the Ottoman Empire against the Russians. It's a bit like, a bit like today, really. You know, all manner, manner of our horrors were... Uh, forecast if the Russians were to get their way and not stopped, you know, we get that in the Middle East now. Uh, and this were, and in those days, of course, it was, the Russians would have even been threatening India. But Cobden wouldn't have any of this. He said that uh, if Turkey were to collapse as a result of its backwardness and inertia, uh, he was convinced this would benefit Britain, which was a great commercial and manufacturing power. Any modernization of backward lands, he said, whether by Russia or anyone else, would be in the UK's interests. Uh, Cobden pointed out, said that the Russian advance to the Black Sea in the 19th century had actually increased UK trade in that area. Uh, Cobden was also a fan of the uh, New World and especially the US, and he, he thought this set a fine example against uh, Europe. He said the emergence of an independent Western Hemisphere had revolutionized the world economy and shown up the closed economies of Europe. He said, the world is destined to become the arbiter, sorry, the new world is destined to become the arbiter of the commercial policy of the old. And that, that was his way of putting it. He said, the Atlantic and not the Mediterranean was going to become the new fulcrum of power. And he said, some, this is something these parochial Europeans failed to see. Um, he thought that America set a good example and, and, uh, of free trade, remember this is the 19th century, of free trade uh, no imperial responsibilities and a non-interventionist foreign policy. He said, with the Navy small than the UK's, American, America enjoyed a secure and steadily growing commerce. It served as an example to the UK, and Britain could too turn its back on uh, Europe and empire and should concentrate on economic growth and non-intervention. I think these two pamphlets might actually be the very best of uh, Comden's writings. They're very fresh and a good read. And uh, they propelled him straight away into politics, and he stood as an MP for Stockport in 1837. Although he was defeated, he immediately threw himself into the formation of the Anti-Corn Law League in 1838. The Corn Laws were taxes on imported grain uh, designed to keep the prices high for cereal producers in Great Britain. They imposed, imposed steep import, uh, import duties making it too expensive for anyone to import grain from other countries, even if uh, food supplies were short. Um, the laws were supported by the conservative landowners and opposed by industrialists and the workers. Uh, the Anti-Corn Law League, uh, which was formed basically by Cobden and then um, the other major uh, organizer member was someone called John Bright, um, I think the anti corn League was responsible for turning public opinion um, against the uh, laws, and not just public, but the ruling class opinion against the corn laws. Uh, Cobden had four arguments, uh, main arguments against the corn laws, um, and uh, when he advocated for, for, uh, their repeal, he said, first of all, uh, you would guarantee the prosperity of the manufacturers of uh, Britain uh, by uh, outlawing, out, sorry, by producing outlets for uh, his products. What he meant was really that um, if the foreigners could uh, export their grain to the UK, they would then receive the money to be able to buy the manufactured goods, which of course at the time Britain was uh, preeminent in. Uh, he also 
uh, stress the fact that um, the, the grain would alleviate this condition of England question, which was basically to do with poverty, and by, by cheapening the price of food and ensuring more regular employment. After all, cheaper goods are what raises the standard of living of uh, people. He also argued that uh, English agriculture would become more efficient because the increased wealth that, uh, that you'd get from reducing the price of um, the corn would stimulate demand for products in urban and industrial areas. And then, fourth of all, he always stressed the um, importance of mutually advantageous international trade, which would be an important um, step towards international fellowship and peace. And that, was, of course, was always the um, centre point of the Manchester Doctrine, as it was called. Um, and he said the only barrier to these four outcomes was the ignorant self-interest of the landlords, what he called the Brecht-taxing oligarchy, unprincipled, unfeeling, rapacious and plundering. Um, In 1841, Peel was defeated in a, um, uh, a motion. And, um, sorry, let's get this right way around. Peel defeated the Melbourne ministry in a motion, and the general election in Co uh, Cobden was returned to uh, Parliament. Uh, and it was over the next five years that Cobden and Bright pursued this uh, propaganda campaign against the Corn Laws, both inside and outside Parliament. Uh, I think the league, the league was the first, certainly one of the first, uh, powerful national lobbying groups. Uh, we've, we've, we're so used to them now uh, that we don't notice it, but I think the, the League was one of the first ones. And it, it was uh, it had a consistency of purpose. It was very well funded. You know, you could get the manufacturers um, to fund it. Uh, very strong local and national organizations. And of course, you had very, very talented and uh, clear-minded uh, leaders in um, Cobden and Bright and one or two others. And uh, the repeal of the Corn Laws actually was passed in the House of Commons in 1846 by 98 votes. Uh, the immediate precipitating cause actually was the Irish famine, I think. But the in intellectual spade work had been done by the League. Um, when, he, when he'd uh, made this... Uh, Achievement when he'd done this achievement, it, it, there was a question about what he should actually do next and uh, what, what Cobden should do next. And he decided on a campaign for peace and retrenchment um, as his major political uh, aims now. But uh, one of the things that had happened, actually, while he devoted himself to politics, was that he'd um, run into financial difficulties. And that was the Calico Works, which he'd... Um, uh, left, to, I think, to his brother and a few other uh, people to run, had run into, uh, had, uh, run into difficulties. And um, he had, there had to be a, a general public subscription to enable uh, Cobden to be rescued financially. He almost went bankrupt. And to continue in politics. Um, actually, Cobden's record as an investor is a bit spotty. You know, he's quite a bright fellow. But uh, whenever I read about his uh, business life after he'd moved into politics, he, uh, he, he seems to be making a mess. Uh, he, uh, he bought some real estate near Manchester, and uh, he, he lost money on it. And then back in the 1850s, he, decided, he was very keen on America. He decided to invest in uh, America's future, and he bought stock in the Illinois Central Railroad. Um, of course, there were these big railway booms in the 19th century, and uh, everybody wanted to get in on them. Uh, but uh, Cobden didn't actually regard it as a speculative investment. He said um, uh, this was backed by a land grant from the state, from the Illinois. He said it's, it's the value of the, this land which attracted Cobden. He, he, he said it's not a railroad speculation, he told his uh, financial advisor, but the acquisition of a landed estate more than double the area of Lancashire. He said, so certain was Cobden of the uh, value of, the ultimate value of this stock, that he sold everything he had to sell, borrowed all he could, 
and secured as many shares as possible. Of course, you can guess the rest. In, a, in 1857, the Illinois stock dropped 40% in the panic, stock market panic of that year. And to add to all of this, of course, the stock was not fully paid up. So there were calls, further calls on Cobden to pay uh, the rest. And um, he was told to sell it, but he wouldn't. And he, again, he got his friends, these, these long-suffering friends, to come in and, uh, and uh, back him up and subsidize him. But he, I think he had this attitude, you know, um, the way to make a fortune in investment is to get a tip on a share. And that's the way. It's a bit like someone saying, you're saying to someone, can you give me the tip on which ticket is going to win the lottery? You know, it's about, it's about, as, um, it's about as likely that you're going to uh, win with that method as well. But let's get, let's get back to what he was successful in, and that is propaganda and... Uh, Politics. Uh, in the after the uh, fall after the fall of the Corn Laws, uh, Cobden in the 1850s he carries out various campaigns, particularly in um, British foreign policy and against what was really the uh, expansion of the I would say the British Empire and um, the various panics. Uh, for instance, on on the um, Establishment of the Second French Empire in 1851-52, uh, Louis Napoleon took power because Louis Napoleon was the um, nephew of the uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, and um, that had all sorts of uh, implications and memories for uh, most people in Britain. And, and uh, the politicians played on this and re produced this uh, panic. And um, uh, they represented Louis Napoleon as about to make a you know, sneak invasion, this sort of, uh, this sort of stuff. And uh, if you go around the um, coast, or you see that program Coast on TV, sometimes they show you these forts, these old forts, which are still dotted around the British coast. And a lot of these were built as a result of these various panics in the 19th century. Um, and, uh, you know, nowadays, I think they, one of them was used, wasn't it, for, um, uh, for, for, a, yeah, and for a radio, um, radio, radio catalog, I think one of them w was used for that. And uh, I think some of them even been turned into, been bought and uh, used uh, to live in. But, um, okay, but at the time, of course, it was taken quite seriously. And, uh, but Cobden, of course, could see it was ridiculous. And uh, he, he, he sought to calm the... Uh, people down. And in fact, he, he, he ran the risk of losing a lot of his popularity, which he gained on the uh, Corn Law issue. And for a while, he was uh, evidently the best abused man in Britain. He, he, wrote an, he eventually wrote a pamphlet um, and called it, it was called The Three Panics, a uh, historical episode. And were, these referred to the various French invasion panics. There's one in 1847-48. Another one in 1851-52, that was the one I was talking about, the Louis Napoleon one. And then there was another one in 1859-60, which we'll come to. Um, a couple of other things he, um, he, uh, he mentioned, one what he protested about. One was the, um, in, in 1852, the government of uh, British India invaded the uh, coastal provinces of Burma. And uh, Cobden hadn't the slightest doubt that the British uh, Indian government was at fault because many of the merchants had been making these really frivolous complaints about the behaviour of the uh, Burmese and of course the British naval commander in Rangoon had acted on them um, and uh, launched his invasion uh, uh, he, he, Cobden wrote this piece How Wars Are Got Up in India uh, with information largely published from uh, government documents um, and publicised the business. Actually, it was around this time that Cobden, I think, uh, correctly, he, he said that he didn't think the, the peace movement could ever have the same strength as the um, anti corn Law League. And uh, he noted that um, uh, many of the people who were prominent in the uh, anti corn Law League, well, you couldn't recruit them to the more general cause of peace. I mean, I think the anti corn Law League, you had this... Um, 
combination of manufacturers and the working class who all wanted cheap bread. You know, that was a simple, simple message. And um, uh, many of the things, of course, which Cobden stood for, were he opposed the Chartists. But on this one issue, the uh, bread and corn laws, you, you could unite the, the uh, middle class and manufacturers and the Chartists. Um, another issue which he uh, complained about was the um, uh, there was a rupture in China in 1857 between uh, uh, the governor in Hong Kong, the British governor in Hong Kong, who actually had been an old free trader, a guy called Baring, and the Chinese governor of the Canton province. And it was all centered around a, um, a small vessel called the Arrow. But the dispute had resulted in the British destroying uh, Chinese river forts, burning 23 ships belonging to the Chinese Navy and bombarding the city of uh, Canton. Uh, Cobden became uh, convinced after he looked at the official documents, that the British behaved quite wrongly. And he brought a motion in Parliament to this effect. And there was a long debate, and he was supported by Gladstone, uh, Lord John Russell, and Benjamin Disraeli. And this and it eventually ended in the defeat of uh, Palmerston by a majority of 16. Um, it is, uh, so he was quite successful in that, but there was a, a lack of success really, in um, the other big issue of the 1850s, and that was the Crimean War, which occurred between 1854 and 56. Uh, from the outset, he opposed the war, along with John Bright. And actually, from this distance, looking at it, it, it seems incredible that Cobden's resistance to this war, which was absolutely colossal blunder, you know, on a par with the Boer Wars or the recent Iraq Wars, um, that uh, his opposition to this war sort of subjected him to so much criticism. And eventually, Cobden and Bright lost their um, parliamentary seats. And uh, the animosity, the public animosity towards them was so great that Cobden said that once a war, if ever he criticised a war before it started, but once a war had started, he'd never speak out against it while it was actually uh, running. And uh, I think Morley, John Morley, who wrote the biography of Cobden, followed the, uh, that maxim, because when the Boer War broke out in uh, 1900, I believe it was, he immediately shut up, went away, and wrote the biography of uh, Glaston while the Boer War was on, and then when it was over, he came back. And of course, I don't, I don't think he ever spoke out against the First World War, even though he voted against it and resigned when the First World War broke out in 1914. Morley. Um, I don't think he's ever spoke much out uh, when it was running. Okay, um, those are some of the uh, battles he uh, led in the eighteen um, in the eighteen fifties. Um, one of the things he said, he wrote a pamphlet on the uh, Crimean War. It's called "What Next and Next." He, he actually published this at the beginning of eighteen fifty six when the peace negotiations were just starting. And um, Cobden noted that the um, um, Allies were saying that the Russians were, were going to be limited to so many warships in the Black Sea. And uh, he, said, he said it's ridiculous to um, specify what uh, the Russians are going to be able to do or not do in their own uh, backyard, you know. And... Um, uh, he said, although Greece might have to submit to some humiliation, and particularly when he was talking about was something called the Don Pacifico uh, incident, which I won't go into, but it was basically, uh, it, it, it um, concerned a private citizen who had dubious British citizens. Uh, sorry, uh, Don Pacifico was a, a man who had a partial British citizenship, I believe, and the British government intervened and uh, humiliated the Greek government, really. And, he's, uh, and he said, you can do this sort of thing to Greece, but you won't be able to do it to some, somewhere like Russia. And of course, I was reading this, and I was thinking, is he talking about then, or is he talking about now? You know, I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't quite sure. Uh, but yeah, we get an echo of that with the attitude of the um, uh, European uh, 
EU towards Greece. And uh, of course, they think they can do the same in the Ukraine to Russia, but I mean, they're not going to be able to do that. Okay. Uh, both Cobden and Bright got their uh, seats in Parliament back in 1859. And uh, Cobden actually was invited to uh, be a minister in uh, Palmerston's uh, new government. But uh, of course, Cobden and Palmerston had been at loggerhead. You know, Cobden was in favour of non intervention, uh, a modest foreign policy. And Palmerston was the archetypal uh, neocon. If you like, of the 19th century, if we if we have uh, if we can put put that you know we back in time. Sorry, if we can use it in that case. If we can do that, yeah. <laughs> he had the same sort of views about Britain, which the neocons have about the U.S. You know, you know, we're we're a preeminent power. We should take liberty wherever uh, we can and do this, do that, and um, so he believed in the forward policy. And of course, Cobden was his great enemy. And um, uh, so he wouldn't join. Uh, he wouldn't join Palmerston's government, so he could speak out freely. But he 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 went to. Um, he, he wanted to uh, calm relations between Britain and France. That was one of the th one of his great aims. Because remember, at the time, France was regarded as a preeminent European power, and Britain, fifty years earlier, fought this incredibly long war and long and costly war. And um, uh, Cobden actually went to um, France, and um, he, uh, he originated talks with uh, someone called Michel Chevalier, who was a French free trader. And um, he did this on an informal basis, and then he went back to the UK, still not a minister, and told Palmerston and Russell and Glaston about this, that he'd like to visit France and get uh, a free trade treaty going to um, improve relations. He, he went back to, they said, okay, he went back to Paris. He uh, had a long audience with Louis Napoleon, who was quite um, amenable to this sort of uh, uh, treaty. And um, after he then... Uh, laid the groundwork, he was actually given plenty of potential powers. He was never officially a, a British minister. And they had this long, long negotiations where he, he had to fight the hostility of the French protectionists, who were quite strong in France at the time. And um, this last invasion panic, you know, they had an invasion panic. In the midst of these negotiations, Palmerston whipped up this bloody panic in the House of Commons. Um, so the, um, and uh, he was, went, went fortifying the naval arsenals of Britain uh, and made this warlike speech directed against France, saying France was a danger, uh, uh, we were in danger of this and that and the other. And of course, this annoyed the French. And so Cobden had to sort of calm this all down. But eventually, at the end of it all, uh, a treaty was um, reached between Britain and France, a free trade treaty. And, um, of course, Cobden, this was, in a sense, the most tangible achievement, Not if we, if we exclude propaganda, the most tangible achievement was the uh, free trade treaty with France. Um, he was offered various... Um, uh, he was offered a baronetcy and uh, a seat on the Privy Council, and the uh, Louis Napoleon would have gladly given him uh, whatever, you, whatever the French gift to... Uh, somebody as an honor but Cobden stayed clear of all that because he wanted to keep his hat if you like he wanted to be able to criticize Palmerston in the future um, and as I said he obviously was a free he believed in free trade but he saw that as a very uh, powerful and the best means of um, promoting peace and uh, between the countries, and that was, I think that was his main motive for the commercial treaty with France. Um, the fi really, the final uh, big issue in uh, Cobden's life was the American Civil War, which broke out in the early 1860s. Uh, Cobden was very, very uh, pro-American, as I mentioned. He, he saw uh, America as the future, really. And... Um, so he was, he, was very, he was very sad about this um, possible split. 
Uh, John Bright, his friend, was very um, pro the North, uh, and his sympathies were completely with the North, and um, Bright wanted to, the North to win this war pretty well at all costs. Um, but Cobden was more split. He was, ob he was very much um, against slavery, but he was, all, he, he was even more so. He was even more against war. And uh, he, he was very anxious that, that Britain wouldn't um, get involved in this uh, uh, civil war at any point. In fact, there was some, there was some I think Palmerston half had a yen to get involved, supporting the South, you know. Uh, but it never, it never came to anything. Um, uh, you see, Cobden thought, First of all, he, he, he could see how destructive war was. Uh, but he thought slavery was an evil, but it was doomed economically. And the North would, in any case, uh, dominate in the long run. So, you know, he, he thought, well, you may as well let the South go. Their, their system can't last. And, of course, um, he's right on that. You know, uh, the Brazilians uh, abolished slavery, I think, in the 1880s. There was no war. They didn't have to have a war to do it. It was just something that was uh, coming anyway. And uh, Cobden, he wrote to an American, uh, important American friend in the summer of 64, he said, there's a constant struggle in my breast against the paramount abhorrence of war as a means of settling disputes. If it were not for the interest which I feel in the fate of the slaves, I should turn with horror from the details of your battles and only for peace at any terms. Um, so you can see that in the question of the American Civil War, Cobden's abhor abhorrence of war overrode his distaste for slavery. You know, it was a, uh, avoid war, number one, even if it was um, for a good cause. Um, Cobden and Bright, by the way, as, as an aside, they didn't differ very much. You know, they basically were both um, classical liberals, free traders. But uh, whenever they differ, when I've come across the differing, uh, Cobden seems to be right and Bright's wrong as far as I can see. Uh, for instance, after the success of the uh, anti corn Law League, uh, Bright wanted to widen the um, uh, campaign, the peace and retrenchment campaign, to uh, widen the franchise. And Cobden, I think rightly, was, to de was dubious as to where uh, uh, any, a widened uh, franchise would lead. Uh, Bright was also in favor of using the British Empire as a means to advance their causes, you know, for free trade and, and uh, such like. But Cobden just said the empire uh, couldn't last and that it should be disbanded. And of course, we've got the position on the American Civil War. And I think, I think Cobden's position is the um, uh, correct one. Uh, Cobden died in uh, 1865, shortly after the um, end of the Civil War. He it always suffered from uh, uh, problems with, um, I think in, in these days it'd be, it'd be seen to be asthma, but certainly problems with lungs. And eventually, I think they um, they got the better him. Uh, and I'll just make a few comments now about foreign policy as a general uh, as a general comment. Uh, A. J. P. Taylor in his book The uh, Troublemakers just co called Cobden the most original and profound of the radical dissenters. Um, you see, uh, my view on Cobden is this. He was born in about 1804. He could see the Industrial Revolution occurring around him, and he could see free trade and the new econ economics enriching people, uh, making people much better off. And uh, he saw it as a new era. You know, he wasn't one of these people who hankered for any, any, any of the old sort of rustic uh, paradise. He could see that this was a good thing and uh, it was the future. But he also thought that um, just as we were getting a new economy and enriching ourselves, we should also get a new foreign policy. He regarded the old foreign policy, the balance of power stuff, as a kind of feudal way of looking at the world. So just as we're gonna get the new factories new standards of living to overtake the old, um, very poor method of living, you know, the old agricultural system, he thought we should have a new kind of foreign policy to 
replace the old feudal balance of power type things. Um, so I've already mentioned that he was particularly scathing about this whole Eastern question business, the, the Ottoman Empire being propped up by the British, um, because the idea was that if Turkey collapsed, you know, Russian troops would soon be marching down the Hindu Kush into India. And of course, the um, Commons said it was ridiculous. Um, and it, as he said, um, it was a gross fallacy that the UK had an interest in maintaining the fairest regions of Europe in barbarism and ignorance, that we are benefited because poverty, slavery, polygamy, and the plague abound in Turkey. Uh, Russia was capable of becoming a modern state, and this was welcome. Uh, and of course, the Ottoman Empire did collapse, and um, there were no disastrous consequences, consequences for Britain, Britain or the British Empire at the time. Uh, another example of this uh, balance, balance of power, this is uh, something I, I came up with, was the, um, this business about the, uh, you know, the dominant power on the European continent. For instance, uh, you, you know, it, it was held that Germany shouldn't be, uh, or, or France or, or Spain, for that, shouldn't be the dominant European power. And this was one of the reasons why the UK entered the war in 1914. But uh, the, the German uh, chancellor at the time, I think it was Beckmann Holweg, uh, one of his war aims was to form a customs union on the uh, European continent, which would, as Beckmann Holweg thought, would be dominated by Germany. And of course, Britain went to war to, to stop this. But of course, we now got a customs union on the continent of Europe. Uh, and we seem to be able to live with it. You know, there doesn't seem to be a problem. Um, so I, I think Cobden would have uh, pointed that out, clearly. Uh, what, another thing that he, he criticized was this, uh, he said, what, 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 was, what, what is Britain going to do for the uh, universal cause, uh, cause of uh, liberty? You know, that was a, a big thing in the, what we, what, you would now, what we would now call the um, uh, liberal interventionism is, is its new name. And, um, Cobden had a number of things to say about this, and one of them he said, he, he said that, that uh, he, he denied the uh, Britain's superiority, moral superiority in this regard. He says, do, do, does, do, does Britain have the virtue and wisdom to perform this role? He said, there's much to be done in Britain. Um, he said, it's this, it's this spirit of interference with other countries, the wars to which it has led, and the subsequent diversion of men's minds from home grievances that we must attribute the unsatisfactory state of the mass of our people. And he noted, he said, the British aristocracy is essentially warlike. Um, it's just, there's no bigger delusion, he said, that Britain's a peace-loving nation. Uh, and that's why this first principle was Cobden's, of Cobden's foreign policy was no intervention. I mean, it carries on. I mean, this Chinese president's just got here. I turned the news on yesterday. And they kept saying, saying on the news, uh, to uh, some minister or somebody, so, are you going to bring up the cause of human rights to this Chinese president? Are you going to bring up the cause of human rights? And they would say, oh, well, we'll do it in private, or, uh, you know, we've got to do it diplomatically. But, I mean, Britain's in no position to bring up the cause of bloody human rights to uh, the Chinese president. It's ridiculous. Um, you know, uh, th they've been uh, bombing here, there, everywhere in the Middle East for about 10 years. Will the Chinese president bring that up? with the uh, British Prime Minister. You know, he might as well. Um, yeah, you know, first of all, put your own house in order, and then you could go around uh, telling other people what, uh, what is right, because Cobden was right on, it, right on this. I mean, in, I remember in, uh, was it 19, when was the Serbian bombing? 1990, I don't think this was, what, was what something Britain did, but they actually bombed, I think it was the American, uh, they actually bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade killed a number of Chinese. I mean, will the Chinese president bring that up? So you're a member of NATO, you've been bombing, you've been killing our people, you know. <laughs> we haven't been killing your people, you've been killing ours, you know. <laughs> Don't chatter to me about human rights. It's ridiculous. Um, so that was one of his, um, his uh, major points. And um, 
One of these, he said, the progress of freedom depends more upon the maintenance of peace, the spread of commerce and the diffusion of education than upon the labours of cabinets and war officers. And that is absolutely right. Uh, you know, uh, Taylor maintains that Cobden was very successful, that um, in the early 1860s, uh, he was a real influence on foreign policy. He said the commercial treaty, yeah, Cobden was a great fan of international arbitration, um, he said in the, there was a war over Schleswig-Holstein in 1864 and there was no talk, serious talk about Britain getting involved, even though it would have been easy for the British government to be involved because it was, um, Denmark was easily accessible to sea power. And a lot of people were chattering about the freedom of the Baltic, you know, and that sort of stuff. Um, but they never did. And uh, Taylor maintains that uh, between 1864 and 1906, no British government seriously contemplated armed in intervention on the continent of Europe. And uh, that was down to um, Cobden to a large extent. And of course this com 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 compares well with this sort of serial bungling of recent uh, British foreign policy in the Middle East, um, which is a perfect example of what happens if you do have foreign interference. Uh, I believe Cobden's favorite toast was to uh, no foreign politics. I think that should also be ours. Any comments or questions? Yes? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the, for the speech. It was uh, very, very interesting. I certainly uh, learned a fair bit about uh, Cobden from it. Uh, I look forward to reading a bit more about him. Um, I would uh, just question, though, uh, a couple of things here in what you said. Um, but first of all, in regards to uh, the United Kingdom during World War One, I, I didn't think that we actually uh, wanted to enter World War One. I. I, I was under the impression we only really became involved in World War One because we had a, a, a secret agreement with the French, which was that the, the French Navy would uh, protect the Mediterranean points, uh, ports uh, for France, and that the British Navy would protect the, the North Sea and Channel and Atlantic ports. Uh, and it was only really when uh, World War I was, was getting underway there was the prospect of the German Navy uh, actually attacking French ports and being in presence in strong numbers uh, in the British Channel uh, and not challenged by not challenged by the French Navy, that we actually were were then under pressure to to support uh, the the French uh, in in the war there. Um, the other point that I was going to, to raise was as regards the the Ottoman Empire. It could be argued, because the Ottoman Empire struggled on then until uh, it, it finally collapsed, I think, actually, in, in the First World War. It could be argued that the only reason that uh, the Ottoman Empire wasn't then overrun by the Russian Empire was that the Russians had been also been involved in the World War I and weren't in any condition at the end of that war to overrun anyone. Uh, and so it, it, it doesn't really follow as, a, as an argument. But thank you very much anyway. Well, I don't think we disagree on the, the World War One. I mean, the, the position of British foreign policy after uh, 1900 is a gradual re-engagement with Europe, and that's continued throughout the whole of the 20th century. So the agreement with France uh, was um, really brought, brought by, in by the... Um, uh, Gray, the uh, Liberal Foreign Secretary, who was keen to get uh, Britain involved. And um, it was aimed against Germany. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I mean, uh, uh, you know, it was sold to the British public as Britain intervened because uh, the Germans had invaded Belgium. And that's how it was sold. But, I, you know, I think that Britain uh, was keen to join France to oppose Germany to um, maintain the balance of power doctrine, which I, I, I talked about. Um, I think it was a huge mistake. Um, you know, Britain should have stayed out of that war. I agree. Um, 
By the way, I, I, one thing I discovered was there was no vote. This, this is just an aside. There was no vote in the parliament on World War I. You know, it was just something put through. And uh, uh, someone, uh, I, someone wrote an article and said there was none of the combatants of, uh, in World War I had debates even in parliament prior to the war, you know, the, n none of them had uh, debates. And, uh, uh, but Britain did, it had a debate a, year, a, a, a day before, two before the war. But of course, you know, the, in Germany, the foreign policy was a preserve of the uh, Kaiser and the Chancellor. And so the, uh, the Reichstag didn't have a uh, vote on whether they should go to war or not. But of course, neither did the British, and the first vote in the UK Parliament was a vote on uh, war uh, credits. But that was exactly the same in Germany. You know, the first vote the Reichstag got was on war credits. Because the, even though they didn't have a vote on foreign policy in the Reichstag, they could obviously have a vote on the financing of the war once it got going. <laughs> But uh, okay, that was uh, that was best. on the Turkey thing. Well, um, I think the Allies had secretly promised, and you can perhaps agree with this, Constantinople to Russia as a as a reward for fighting on the side of the Allies. But once the Bolsheviks took over, all this went to, to the bar. You know, the, and I think Lenin. And the Bolsheviks, as a record, they published these secret treaties which the, um, the British and French had made with the Tsar and the Tsar government. And one of them was this um, the secret treaty that they promised Constantinople to the. So, you know, it, they, they changed their mind about Turkey. Clearly. Uh. Oh, Some dull points of um, interest. Uh, Mornington Crescent. Oh, yes. So there's, there's a statue there. The radio oh, program. Right. There's a statue, and I'm surprised to see Napoleon. Napoleon. Yes, Napoleon bought that, yes. yes. And, and established it in Wanton Present, yes. Public Camden Town. Well, it may have been a public subscription. But statue he, of Cobden. He paid a great deal towards it, yes. Just that oh, interest. I think he bought it completely. Oh, yeah, the whole thing. It's a gift, yes. Uh, secondly, Doctor Who, um, during one of the panics, or as a consequence of it, the Palmerston Forts, a great expense, great big round things. There's one in Portsmouth, Sand, was used in Doctor Who and other, and other things uh, some years back. Now that was a very expensive piece of kit and that was the result of old Pam and his, um, his fears of the French. Yes, uh, I said there are three of these panics which uh, Cobden wrote about. They're extremely expensive, of course, because you're building these forts around. And one of them, occurs in the middle of the uh, Cobden negotiating this uh, commercial treaty and trying to improve relations. So he's trying to improve relations in Paris, trying to negotiate with the French to improve things. And there's this bloody big Palmerston back in the House of Commons uh, chattering about how dangerous the French are, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, well, um, yeah, next line. <laughs> There's quite a few things we can go through, but uh, um, it made me sadly, it was entirely a good thing that there was a success with the commercial treaty. And on, on certain things, the French were more free trade than we were, apparently. But there, but there wasn't, it wasn't a sort of a big bang. No one has tariffs on anything, or no one has. No, there were, and the, the French had some lower than the we did, but still, I said we, uh, the British government. So there's that. But of, of great significance is that the, um, the Entente Cordiale may in some measure have followed on from the success of the commercial treaty. Maybe not. But that unfortunate, that unfortunate movement to, um, send the, uh, to allow the French uh, fleet to be moved to the Mediterranean to counter the Germans and the Russians, or certainly the Germans, uh, meant that the British would uh, guarantee French coast to the French in the event of a war. And because that was an under undertaking, there's certain other undertakings to the French in the event of a war, 
easily followed on. Sadly, of course, this led to the entanglement of Britain in the Great War. Yeah, but I don't think that was a result of the commercial treaty 50 years earlier, was it? I mean, look, um, I think that was just to improve commercial relations and ease tensions. I mean, there was a war in 1870 between um, the Germans and the French, and the British never intervened. Well, they never intervened. It never looked like intervening, as far as I know. Um, I think there's a definite movement from 1904 onwards, and uh, I think the um, uh, the guilty, the main guilty man was um, uh, uh, Gray, Lord Gray. You know, the, the uh, what, what was his favorite? What was it? The saying, you know, the candles. The lights are going out. All over Europe. Or, uh, they will not be lit again in our lifetime. Well, he's bloody putting the, putting them out. <laughs> yes. You know, uh, it's helping to anyway. Uh, I always uh, laughed at that. And um, yeah, he was one of the main people who pushed for uh, British um, intervention in World War One. And um, uh, many of the, uh, of course, the thing is, we had the uh, the Tory Party have always been the War Party in this country. But in 1914, we had the anti-war party in power. So there was never a better chance for uh, Britain to stay out of the war. And um, many of the people who were in the cabinet of 1914, most prominently being Lloyd George, had been opposed to the Boer War. Although, of course, at that time, the Liberals were out of power. Um, had been opposed to the Boer War. But, so they were opposed to the Boer War, but the much bigger European war Lloyd George, and, and he was the most influential figure, uh, they voted in favour of it. Or didn't, at least, uh, stick out against it. <laughs> no one else, Bob. <laughs> uh, uh, do you, have you put your hand up before? Oh, you're there. What's your name, by the way? What is your name? Oh, Reese. Um, Reese. Th thanks for talking to me. It's really good to hear a you know, talk on foreign policy, especially from people that associate with libertarianism. Um, so I want to start your views down. Like, I'm someone that really hates um, this country's foreign policy. Um, it makes me look quite sick to be fair. Who's, who's foreign policy? This country's this foreign country policy. This country's foreign policy. From Iraq to Afghanistan to um, probably Syria soon and you know, Libya a few, a few years back. What? means is that people, we're, we're in danger when we travel to these countries and people want to kill us. Um, do you think that if um, Britain had a more non-interventionist foreign policy, um, we, we would have more of a moral high ground? And um, also, what do you think the future is for British foreign policy? Because I personally would like it to be non-interventionist, but we can be non-interventionist if we want, but have we got ourselves in so deep with Iraq and Afghanistan that we can say, oh, we're not going to get involved in a war, but terrorists will still say, it's too late, mate. You tried to invade us before and bomb us, so we're gonna bomb you as much as we can, or you know, chop off the heads of British citizens as much as we can. I mean, so, 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 so what do you think we do? What do you think the future for us holds in terms of our foreign policy? Well, obviously, I'm in favour of non-interventionist foreign policy, and, and certainly, if you do that, I think you are uh, uh, in a, in a better moral position. You know, as I said, I don't think we're in any moral position at all to lecture. To the Chinese, you know that, that, that uh, um, Chinese government on on, on, uh, on, uh, on any subject really. I thought it was absolutely ridiculous. But okay, um, I mean, I think in in a sense it's gone too far now. You know, they um, uh, you should certainly stop in, get, in intervening in these countries. But there's going to be collateral damage now anyway. Although you have to say that many of these terrorists. Um, don't care that you're British or American. You know, if you can get hold of a Western, someone as you see as a Western uh, uh, hostage, that's just as good for them. You know, it wouldn't matter if they were Swiss, I don't think. You know, uh, I, I haven't seen all the hostages. I can't remember them all. But I don't think, you, you know, you have to be American or British. You don't You don't have to be belong to a country. I think Japanese, for instance, yeah. have uh, been uh, taken uh, and killed. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if you're just seen as generally, um, uh, for some of these, non-Islamic non is good enough. So you're saying that someone like... So, so I mean, for instance, there's a business in Ke there was this terrorist group in uh, Kenya. Uh, I can't remember their name. And they went around a university campus, did the killing? Uh, Boko Haram. Sorry? Boko Haram. 
No, I don't think it was Bulgarian. I think it was a different one. Um, there are different ones. But, you know, it, it, it was sufficient that you didn't, you know, go to their, follow their particular line. But, you know, I see these groups as a primary response to uh, the destabilizing of a country. And, you, you know, if you have uh, stability in a country, they'll get rid of these people. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, to that, um, was Cotton, you think, a, a, a moral relativist, or was he just uh, saying that the government shouldn't shouldn't uh, speak up? Because I'm I'm also very very much uh, in favor of non-interventionism uh, militarily, but I am very much in favor of speaking out against. Uh, uh, bad things that governments do in the world. But, I mean, I can see your point that if we do that right now with our foreign policy, we, we, we are essentially hypocrites. Um, but but no, other I, than that, I, I wouldn't mind telling the Chinese that they should he, he, he just saw that government meddling abroad made things, and tend to make things much, much worse. And that's what we've been talking about recently. I mean, the situation vis-a-vis -vis this country and the Middle East, and citizens of this country and the Middle East, it's much, much worse. It's got much, much worse over the last 10 years. Um, and you know, I would be dubious about traveling to any of these countries now. Whereas 20 years ago, you could travel to most of them with, with, without any uh, problems. Um, but no, Cobden wasn't uh, uh, averse to private citizens uh, registering their displeasure with um, governments. For instance, when they, um, he, he when some British um, it, uh, bankers and just they wanted to, uh, the Russians came, I think, in the late 1840s. They had just invaded uh, or put down a revolt in Budapest. And there's a guy called Kossuth who came to this country, who was a Hungarian nationalist. Uh, and he went around making speeches, very popular. And uh, the Russians came to London wanting uh, loans to have, uh, you know, to finance this. And uh, various uh, uh, British financiers wouldn't do it. And Cobden was in favor of a campaign to deny uh, the Russians loans. Um, so he wasn't against uh, private citizens uh, doing that sort of thing. And there is a difference, isn't there? I mean, that is clear, you know, you're just denying them a, a commercial loan. You know, you're not going uh, abroad to, uh, you know, you could deny a loan to Saudi Arabia or something like that. You're not necessarily going to go and bomb it, you know. Uh, Bob, and then Pat. Um, do you think you'd rather let the Liberal coast down, him and many others, by supporting the idea of um, state scoring, or at least local government schools? I don't know much about that, to be honest. I know that he did support education, but that was just a big liberal thing. And then I, I, I don't know um, enough about it, but he did support the estate becoming involved in um, education, yeah. And um, of course, it was the liberal government which brought in the 1870 he did. act. I think it's possible they, they thought they were taking it away from the church. They were, they were, yeah, but they're anti-clerical. The liberal movement was anti-clerical. That's for sure. And that was obviously some motivation behind that. And um, in, many, in many ways, the, 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 the church in the 18th century was very reactionary. I mean, there's no get, getting away from that. A point of information there is that Cobden had a very bad experience in a private school, of one of these private schools. And he, when he read Dickens Do the Boys Hall, that reminded him exactly of his experience in the uh, in Nickelbeat Nickel uh, of his. So he was against. Strange, but he was against uh, uh, private schools and in favour of public schools because he thought they'd be more orderly. He's one of the uh, other things in Compton South. Son, in favour of state schools. He's in favour of state schools. Yes, public. Yeah, you're quite right. I mean, the public school, of course, the private school, and in, in any other earlier speech, I'd have said that, that that's rightly named. The Americans might misunderstand it. But it's rightly named public school as private. Uh, yes, uh, you're quite right. I made a mistake there, but that's that was the anomaly in. Um, in, um, you know, he had a bad experience at private school. Uh, so, no, who was it? It was Pat, wasn't it? And then uh, yeah, Reese Reece. again. But Pat first. Just, just a second. Oh, Pat, Jan, and Reese. So it's Jan. I've overlooked Jan. Uh, 
Uh, was Cobden around during, um, during the Opium Wars? Um, what was his Cobden? Was, was he around during the Opium Wars? Those were the 1850s, weren't they? Yeah. Well, I think and one, one of the... his view on them? Well, yeah, I'm pretty certain... I mean, one of the wars which I mentioned, one of the incidents, was uh, uh, in China. And it was to do with this uh, uh, bombing of... Um, sorry, uh, shelling of the uh, Canton and sinking of Chinese vessels. And this was about 1855-56. I don't know if it, that's classed as an opium war. Um... Uh, he would be in favour of free trade, you know, free trade in drugs, but he wouldn't. He wouldn't have been in favour of war to back it up. Well, <laughs> a few libertarians have said to me, "Well, the only war this Britain has ever fought, which was justified, was the Opium Wars. All the other wars weren't really justified. It's from a liberty, strictly libertarian perspective." You mean to enforce free trade? In the, uh, you know, prevent the Chinese bringing well, free, in I mean, duties on opium. Well, yes, I mean, the, the idea of, of, of people having drugs is, is, is a libertarian viewpoint, and so why should any state stop it? Yes, I mean, but even, even recently, the Cobden, Co Cobden just, wouldn't have supported going to war with the country to yeah. enforce free trade. You know, he would have said you have to uh, mm -hmm. debate it with them and say, well, look, this, this, this is the correct policy, and we can argue it through. But he certainly wouldn't have approved of uh, going to war. Going to war. Yeah, you know, yeah. invading France to make sure that, that we get this commercial treaty signed. <laughs> well, it's it's ridiculous. On the United Nations, I, I don't know if you've read this today, but it's recently come out with the idea that uh, you know, drugs should be uh, decriminalised. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I'm with the UN on that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, drugs weren't criminalising Cobden's Day anyway. Jan? The, the idea that the state can be useful in uh, education is, uh, is in Adam Smith. So it goes back at least as far as that. And uh, it, it, Adam Smith is often cited by uh, anti libertarians. You know, even Adam Smith believed in state education. And there, he does, they do have this idea of, I suppose it's sort of an early idea of equal opportunities, equality of opportunity. You know, they, um, uh, the rock is set in early, that you must level the playing field, and at least as regards education, so it wasn't, um, it wasn't just culture. I mean, there was a, there was a, there was yes. a long tradition of that. And I think um, very influential with these um, thinkers who favoured state education, and didn't John Stuart Mill also, wasn't he also sympathetic towards uh, state education? Not so much, actually. But so um, no, wasn't really um, state education. One of the big uh, influences, uh, I think, is always quoted approving, approvingly, is the Pr Prussia, Prussian um, education system. Yeah. Uh, well, no, they got it going in the early nineties. Well, uh, uh, the point of information, the NHS, they quoted Prussia. Yeah. yeah. Just to admit, my point of he wanted. A license for education, in other words, he wanted to, to, to impose compulsory education in so far as he wanted everyone to be uh, educated, but he wasn't in favour of state schools, uh, and he wasn't even in favour of, of school. He just wanted uh, education to be advanced, and he wanted a, a, a license for education. Uh, but he actually held that the newspapers are as good as schools at educating the population. That was just most position. But Reese, can I ask Reese oh. then, Bob? Reese. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask everyone to Reese here. I mean, NATO, um, is, is it possible to have a non interventionist foreign policy and be NATO? Because, I mean, a few weeks ago, I think last week actually, um, a Russian jets are over Turkish, air, Turkish airspace. Now, Turkey is a federal member of NATO. And if Turkey was to get um, attacked, isn't the principle one attack on one member is an attack on us all? So I mean, is is it possible to have um, a non-intervention foreign policy and be a member of organisations like NATO or even the EU or even potentially the UN? I mean, is it possible? Well, I think it is. I think it is. But I, I mean, there the, the should be strictly limited. I mean, it's possible to be in an alliance with a country if. You know, there's an aggressive country nearby in a defensive alliance, 
And NATO originally was a defensive alliance, wasn't it? I think it did act as a defensive alliance. And it's only since 1990 that it's now no, it's plainly no longer a defensive alliance. I mean, that's clear. Uh, you know, it's become uh, an offensive alliance. It's perfectly clear. So uh, I would say at the moment, no, I, I think a libertarian should advocate um, the disbanding of NATO. Yeah, yeah, can I just... Uh, no, no, hang on a bit. Bob, Bob's, Bob's next. You can come back after Bob. On the... Um, seems to get in one of my favourite Victorian names. There was a chap called Collett Dobson Collett. which has a certain symmetry to it. And he was part... He was chief organiser of the battle to get the taxes on knowledge abolished. And this was the quite high tax on newspapers for working people. In other words, cheap newspapers. And, and that was eventually done after quite a campaign. And of course, this seems quaint to our ears because, of course, if you really support something, you have to subsidise it or make it compulsory or something of that kind. Simply the idea that you don't tax it as much as previously and therefore the working man will get his newspapers. Much good it does him at this stage, centrist. But still, that was an example of how to do it. And remember the name Collett Dobson Collett? Was it yes. stamp tax? There was a stamp duty, I think. Uh, yes, stamp duty. Yeah. And that's the sort of thing that Mill would have approved of. Oh, right, sure. I think Mill, the best way of summing up Mill is he, he had a certain thing like, like the compulsory car licence today, the road licence. You can get your MOT anywhere, but you've got to have an MOT, that sort of thing on so education. So parents had to show that, that they were having their children. That they were having their children educated. They could do it themselves or they could have it privately or any way. So, but he wasn't particularly in favour of state education. But Forrester was a follower of Mill and he passed the 1878. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was going to say, just on the, on the gentleman's last question about uh, uh, NATO expansion, so, I mean, the, the dates you mentioned there, I know we're talking about NATO as uh, eastward expansion, so the, the borders with the old Soviet Union. But if you go back to when Turkey joined the, uh, NATO, I mean, which was long before that, I mean, that was a big problem for NATO then. I mean, you could argue that that, that that directly led as well to the involvement of the um, involvement of um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example. Uh, when we were talking, when the gentleman was talking about the you know the, the expansion of our effectively the expansion of our military borders through NATO, I think it was a very bad decision, especially bringing in Turkey to NATO. Madness, madness. And well, I think I think to, what 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 we're juggling with now is, is kind of. Late. I mean, I'm not quite certain where we're going. I I don't see the um, Cuban Missile Crisis as being particularly to do with NATO. I mean, wasn't Tur wasn't Turkey a founding member of NATO? I mean, I, I've always thought oh, that. Well, um, well, if I if I could just say, come, come back to, to the um, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Don't forget, it was defused. Yes by the Americans withdrawing their nuclear missiles from Turkey. That's how it was diffused, wasn't it? Well, no, they, they did... They, 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 they had that as a... That was the behind-the-scenes deal that yeah, went on to get... Yes, there was, a quid, there was a quid pro quo. But, um, well, you know, the, 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 the um, US had nuclear missiles throughout NATO in... Uh, uh, we're talking about the Cold War era. Mm. But, um, I mean, the Cuban Missile Crisis was a, you know, an, an attempt by the Russians to extend their influence in, into the Western hem Hemisphere, and it was a... Yeah, but um, they, they, they were never going, going to allow nuclear missiles into Turkey, which is what happened. And uh, you mentioned, because you mentioned... Sorry, what do you mean they're never going to allow? They were always there. I think it no, means it was, it was done as a way of having them removed. We don't like them. We don't like them close to us. See how you love them close to you. And then Khrushchev agreed to not make public the agreement with the Americans that the, in fact, these missiles were removed from Turkey. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. the because the, the, uh, until shortly before then, the Americans were relying on a bomber force. They didn't have missiles. Missiles were developed. No, okay, but the, the Cuban Missile Crisis was a definite a loss of face. Yeah. For the Soviet Union and for Khrushchev, yeah. obviously, because he lost his bloody job shortly afterwards. Yeah. Well, they got the you know, they kicked him out and said, you know, accused him of adventurism, you know, or interventionism, as Cobden would have called it. Mm -hmm. What's surprising is the same thing didn't happen when NATO moved, moved east. 
to Lithuania, well, Estonia, Latvia. I, I still I go back to my original point to Reese. I said, you know, I, I think NATO, before 1989, NATO was basically mm. a defensive organization, yeah. and it, I, it's, that's no longer true. Yeah, but is it And it, it's now advanced eastwards. It wants to get countries like uh, Ukraine and Georgia. They want to get those into uh, NATO, and of course the Russians don't want that. But isn't NATO, I mean, what was it, Jefferson or one of the founding part of the US, they spoke about a tandem alliance, and, you know, don't get into tandem alliances. Isn't NATO in, a, in, a, in effect? It's George Washington. Yeah, isn't it in, in effect in a tandem alliance? I mean, as I said before, if Turkey was well, to get bombed, bombed by Russia, we'd have to um, go, go there. To be fair, I don't want Britain to be involved in another war. We least with Russia, because let's face it, we've got less than 100,000 men. Russia would be like that. Yeah, I mean, as I said, I, I don't think, I think that when the Warsaw Pact was dissolved, they could have dissolved NATO, or they could have dissolved it after two or three years when it was clear that the Warsaw Pact... It was declared victory. Uh, you know, they could have said, this is it, end of NATO. Uh, but I think it was Peter Bauer who said, you know, uh, these, uh, these international organisations, they never... They never go away, you know, they just uh, metamorphosize. So, for instance, something like the International Monetary Fund, which was um, origi originally formed to provide stability to maintain the, um, the Bretton Woods system, you know, provide, provide liquidity, has changed into something else now, you know. So NATO has changed as well. But you, you, I take your point, you know, they should... Uh, I think it, it would be a good thing if Britain withdrew from NATO now. You know, de Gaulle withdrew from NATO in the 1960s, or partially withdrew. If Corbyn comes into power, maybe he'll take us out of NATO, who knows? He won't come into power. He's all out of peace. But... I mean, he's not too bad. He's, he's got some of these ideas. He, he, he sees that NATO's been expanding eastwards. And when he points this out, you know, every goes shock horror, you know. You're saying what Putin's saying. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Because, because, because no, the UK and the EU, they've been egging, you know, Ukraine on. Come on, join, you know, join NATO if you want, want to, you know, join the European Union. And obviously Russia is, to be fair, like, pissed off thinking, what are you bloody Western are doing? Because obviously Russia will intimidate it. And I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's the West that's propelling it. It's the EU, it's the UK. It's, it, well, the UK's part of the EU, unfortunately. It's, it's the US. I mean, we're egging Russia on to... Well, it is, but yeah, yeah. I, I mean, if we're just discussing the general situation, I, I think that both France and Germany can see that this Ukraine crisis is bad news. It's particularly bad news for Germany because Germany was one of um, if uh, Russia's big. I think Russia's it was actually Russia's biggest trading partner, and Russia's a huge market now. You know, it's been becoming richer. I mean, this is not told you very much. Yes, I mean, it's not like the Soviet Union anymore. It's, you know, it's, it's not as rich as uh, Western Europe, but it's becoming much richer. And it's a huge market for German goods. And of course, they've been hit by uh, these sanctions as much as anybody. And, um, you, you know, it was the American, um, someone in the American State Department who uh, organized or ha uh, egged on this putsch in the um, Ukraine in February two th 2014, I think. And... I think some of the, you know, the Europeans must be realizing, well, you know, the Americans are they're doing these peace, peace deals with Iran and with Cuba, you know, uh, detente with Cuba, detente with Iran, and um, more power to their elbow. You know, but while they're doing detente with people in their own backyard, and people think, uh, they're heightening the, temp uh, the uh, tensions in the Ukraine. Uh, and in the Middle East, you know, on Europe's doorstep. I mean, if there's a war in the Ukraine, they're talking about all the refugees coming from the Middle East. If there's a war in the Ukraine, there'll be a massive movement of population out of Ukraine. There's 50 million people there, you know. And where are they going to head to? Of course, Cobden, Cobden did make the point yeah, repeatedly that sanctions can be as bad as war. And he, he often pointed out the uh, infant mortality rate went up on the sanctions. Yeah, and Ron Paul as well from America, I think, the old congressman, he said sanctions are basically war, it's basically preemptive war, he said. Oh, yeah. right. okay. John? Surely if all the Ukrainians come here, we can all get 
servants again, just like in Downton Abbey. <laughs> no, they're not that poor. <laughs> I can afford to pay 50p a week for my servants. I'm not going to take many offers. But it shows you how many jobs there are out there. Well, I've got it, six more and that's all. If there were no welfare state, it would bring back service. <laughs> If there was so still service now. There's only been one decade when the vast majority of UK jobs haven't been uh, service jobs, and that was the 1950s. I mean, not every other decade, the jobs have mainly been service I mean, jobs. Service in the sense of butlers, maids. Yeah. Point of order. So is it the welfare state service? Uh, yes, but it's uh, it's uh, the tax-based service. Now, t- technically, uh, service is often used to refer to having servants within the yes, house. Yes, yes. I mean, service. Which I made it, yeah. Meant it. Yeah. They talk about the you know, industrial work or service works. And, yeah, yeah. I, I, and in that sense, you know, there's only been one decade. The market is that was only in the 1950s. Yeah. I don't dispute that, yeah. Any more? Anyone want to say anything? Well, you mentioned slavery. So, uh, we, we could, I, I was going to argue, well, at the time of the Civil War, um, there's, a, there's a debate about the, the cause of the, the Civil War and about slavery, which, which was mentioned here. I mean, the, the Southerners pointed out that the Northerners were involved in slavery, and they called it wage slavery. Um, as, oh, that's as just opposed to agricultural slavery. I thought I'd just point that no, out. No, that, that, that's just inconsistent Marxist propaganda. Because mm-hmm. Marx himself followed the slave power, which was uh, by uh, the Irish economist uh, yeah. J.A. Kearns. Yes. And, uh, of course, Kearns said that the, 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 war, the American war was justified because it was getting rid of slavery and so on. And, and uh, Marx himself said, yes, wonderful. He backed that up and he says... He says oh, slavery is in a complete abhorrence, which of course makes a nonsense. So we still hate slavery propaganda. So it's an inconsistency in Marx. Marx knew there was a difference between what he called white slavery, which is petty propaganda, and actual slavery. He knew what free labour was, and he knew what slavery was. But still, I suppose you want to back up now. Then. We were going to just back up before. Uh, <laughs> I just point out on that point. Back, uh, Abraham Lincoln actually owned slavery. Well, so did uh, so did uh, Washington, and in fact, there was only one founding father that didn't, and that was Benjamin Franklin, who was a we good liberal. Well, oh, thank you very much for coming. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.